So hello everybody, it's Steve Bates of the BIA and welcome to this uh, Brexit webinar, the latest in our monthly series on uh, Brexit and the life sciences. I hope in the next half an hour we can um, bring you up to speed on these issues. Uh, so I'm going to talk this week or this month about the uh, UK government opening its consultation on what, it, what we should do about people um, uh, with regard to move, freedom of movement uh, and Brexit. I'm uh, going to talk a little bit about where we've got to in terms of the negotiations um, happening between the EU and uh, the UK. I go into some detail on some of the UK government policy papers that are relevant to our sector that have been published, touch on developments at the EU side. And then I thought as it we're in a summer period and many of you will be preparing for uh, discussions at a global level. Just a quick reminder on um, some of the reasons why we should be confident in the UK about the enduring strengths of the UK bioscience, center, uh, bioscience sector, and then I'll look forward to what's going to happen around the um, uh, the negotiations and some ex uh, some uh, some some senses of what might happen in the autumn going forward. Then I'm happy to take questions, and I've pre-prepared some answers to some of the ones that people have already sent in. So I hope that's of use. And um, with uh, many thanks to my colleague uh, Laura Collister, who has been the uh, brains behind uh, much of the content that you're going to see today. I should also provide expert comment at appropriate points. So last month we went through um, the medicines regulation position, UK politics, what was going on in the parliamentary activity. If you want to see any of these backstories, um, uh, remember they are on our YouTube channel uh, and um, uh, this was quite useful on medicines regulation. So I'm not going to spend a long time on that, but if you want that, it is available uh, on the, uh, the YouTube, uh, uh, YouTube file. Movement of people is obviously the uh, has been a key topic for um, uh, for the sector with regard to uh, to Brexit, and there has been some developments this month, which I shall pass over to Laura Collister to appraise you of. Laura. So, um, UK government has asked the Migration Advisory Committee um, to do a report for it on um, the movement of people, focusing both on Brexit and then also how it feeds into um, industrial strategy, which is obviously um, a key policy for UK government at the moment. They published a consultation which will inform their report to government and the deadline is the 27th of October. So um, alongside, they also produced a number of reports with some information just to get um, respondents thinking about the types of things they should be discussing. And the consultation contains a number of quite specific questions, both around EU and non-EU workers. Um, BIA is going to be doing a joint response with ABPI plus some other partners. And we're going to undertake a member survey to inform the response and um, trying to get some evidence. But equally, we'd also really like to encourage companies to make their own um, submissions to this consultation, just so we really amplify the voice of the UK, uh, UK life sciences sector. Um, and hopefully that will sort of feed through into the committee's report to government. Um, so we will be sending out further information. It will be in our member um, communications and there will be a survey. You may also have received um, a communication from government who are encouraging the sector to respond. Thanks, Laura. So I think on our core issue here, good opportunity to input a structured process by which to do so and a couple of months on this process. So uh, uh, stand by for more uh, from us on this uh, through September and October. You'll be aware of this picture, which we've shown at many points during these webinars down the months. Uh, uh, this is the stage of the, the developments where we're at, stage two, negotiations between the UK and the EU. We imagine this will go on for some time, uh, but just sort of remind you in the, the long drawn out process of Brexit where we're at. We're still only in uh, act two uh, of a multiple act drama. Um, and if you think about what's, uh, what's going to happen in the next, uh, in the immediate future, this is uh, our best guess. I place no, uh, no guarantees on this because um, we don't know. But my, my guess is that, well, we know that there will be negotiation between the UK and the EU next week. We think that the aspiration of the UK government is that that discussion will cover some of the position papers that have been published, including uh, goods on the market, people, what to do with the EU citizens in the UK, UK citizens in the EU, and possibly how much the UK will pay as a uh, pay uh, for leaving the EU, and maybe there will be some discussion about where well, we need to have some further negotiations on an existing timetable. I think the UK government would be interested in having, but I'd be surprised to see 
discussions on trade post Brexit. Um, the UK government has obviously published a customs paper recently and wants to talk about the future relationship, but the EU side have been pretty clear to say that they want to deal with the, um, the first order issue first, and that was for a subsequent debate if progress is made against these. So um, we've got a very long process, but we've got some immediate discussion taking place, and we're aware um, this is my best guess as to what might uh, might be coming coming up in the next week. And there's some I'll t talk in detail about goods on the market as we go forward. So um, one of the things I think we're now seeing in the, the Brexit process is the UK government publishing some policy papers. And uh, since the last Brexit negotiations uh, in July, we've seen the publication of the Future Customs Arrangement paper, Northern Ireland and Ireland paper, confidentiality and access to documents, and continuity in the availability of goods for the UK, EU and the UK, uh, all published in August. Um, I shan't look to go forward uh, on these in too much detail. Uh, it's nice to say, I think, that on the Northern Ireland paper, uh, it's about avoiding a hard move, move border on a movement of goods. Uh, and in confidentiality uh, paper, it's a response to the EU's paper on the functioning of union institutions, agencies and, and bodies, and states the UK recognises the importance of continuing to respect obligations of confidentiality and to protect information exchanged uh, while it's a member state. Um, I think for me, we've not spent a lot of time on that one, and if, uh, if anybody around has expert view on that, I would be keen to understand the life science perspective on it. Um, I've not had time to dig into it in great deal, deal of detail since it came out uh, uh, earlier in the week, because we've been focused on this paper, the continuity and the available of goods for the EU and the UK, and, I'm, um, <clears throat> and I think here, um, the four key principles for ensuring a smooth and orderly withdrawal from the EU with regard to the availability of goods is something that we are pleased to see. Uh, and I think what you're seeing here is um, a pragmatic response from the UK government. And I'm delighted to say that I think it's been informed by some of the expert work that uh, we and the ABPI have been able to input into this. So uh, I think it's good to see uh, reflected back to us uh, in this paper, the uh, importance of some of the issues that we've stressed in the trade bit of work that we've been doing over, over a period of time. I think that the principles around grandfathering of, um, uh, of, of, of goods is important. Uh, I believe that this will refer to centrally authorised products. Um, I, I believe that it's about no changes in labelling, uh, MAH location, master files, etc. <clears throat> And I hope that this is about the compliance activities prior to exit being respected and not duplicated. Um, however, um, whether you can take from the actual paper and do look at this in detail if you're interested, whether these key principles provide legal certainty whilst avoiding disruption. Of course, this is a paper for discussion by the negotiators, but I think it is the UK government's uh, starter. Um, and I think it's helpful, but I think we need to be conscious that it is only one side of, uh, of, of a negotiated debate. What I think is positive is that it's, um, it reflects much of the input that our experts groups have put into the, the, the thinking. So it's good that we're being listened to as, a, as an industry. Um, we obviously have further to go here. Uh, and if you are interested in the detail of trade policy and where it is going and what we think and our interpretation on this, do drop e uh, Laura uh, uh, an, an email. We do have more detail on this paper and our analysis of it if you are interested. But uh, with the confines of time, I'm keen to press on because there's lots more going on. Um, we've welcomed this, uh, this uh, paper yesterday, uh, and this was a statement on there. So we're delighted that it's, um, uh, it's aimed to minimize disruption on safety and monitoring processes for medicines and avoid negative impact on medicine supply. Um, moving on briefly, Laura, um, the customs paper, your take on that. Um, so just quickly to touch on this, um, as the slide says, um, there were three object objectives that um, the paper was setting out, so focusing on frictionless trade, no hard border between Ireland and Northern Ireland, and then an independent trade policy. I think um, generally our understanding is that these three objectives are hard to combine. So UK government has come up with two potential options one of which is a streamlined customs arrangement, and that would be very quick processes at the border. The other suggestion is a new 
customs partnership with the with the EU, and that looks at using technology to move the border away from the actual border. So um, it looks at doing processes um, online and through technology instead of at a location. So um, obviously the paper also talks about interim agreement and transition, doesn't talk about timelines and it says that um, that will need to be discussed with the EU. I think um, for our viewers it, it's a good starting point. Um, there's a couple of headlines here which I think come from Politico um, so that potentially didn't go down growth in some of the press, um, but obviously the UK government is very keen to move on to this issue and push forward. Great stuff. So UK's put some papers out and we're starting to see where they'll land and we'll see whether they are part of the negotiations in the coming weeks. Um, you'll remember the speech given by Medicines uh, Minister, Minister Lord O'Shaughnessy at the joint BIA MHRA conference uh, in July. It's uh, been published uh, on the, um, uh, the gov.uk website and is there in full glory, the transcript of his speech. So if you want to know the UK government policy on medicines regulation post-Brexit, here it is and um, it is available now uh, from uh, an official government source. Uh, our position of course remains the same, whatever the location of the EMA, close alignment on medicines regulation is in the best interests of both the UK and the EU. Flipping to developments at an EU level, um, not a great deal this month, but uh, there was a, 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 a statements from the European Medicines Agency uh, at the beginning of the month on their preparations for Brexit and relocation. They released a business continuity plan. They talked about the need to prioritise and uh, they are uh, saying that they need to reduce their participation in meetings and conferences and scale back some of their lowest priority activities, the medicines uh, web portal work on the e-submissions project in order to focus on what they need to do and they were concerned that they may not be able to maintain the level of operations if job losses resulting from the relocation are more far reaching than expected. So I think sensible planning from the EMA, uh, I think it's to be aware and, um, uh, and it's uh, publicly available. So just a, an important point there if you're engaged with the, the EMA, um, they do see some impact uh, and some of the uh, activities have been reprioritized in order to deliver uh, their relocation and preparations for Brexit. I'm just going to change tack a little here and do a, a couple of minutes on the enduring strength of UK biotech because I think in the, the discussions around Brexit, um, sometimes people are saying, well, how's this affecting the UK sector? And I'm confident about the resilience of the UK sector and here's why. Um, uh, these are, this is data taken from our, uh, our, our report uh, launched earlier in the year, UK Global Bioscience Cluster 2016. The UK, uh, year in, year out, has the strongest pipeline of, uh, of, of, of assets uh, in, um, under development, and this is excluding the global players uh, within, uh, within the UK. Um, in terms of venture capital raise, we're doing very well, not quite at the level of, uh, of the, the giants in San Francisco and Massachusetts, but overtaking San Diego and being a significant part of European uh, venture capital going into life sciences. Uh, and if you look at that, we're uh, bigger than uh, most of the other players uh, around Europe by some degree. Uh, we're lucky to have significant government support, which uh, pre predate much of which predates the discussion around Brexit and has been ongoing for a generation. Uh, some great funding schemes from Innovate UK, uh, good support from the British Business Bank into the, the sector. Um, uh, we have uh, further investment into biomedical research centres, strong investment into the science base, uh, pledges for uh, further uh, developments of the British Business Bank, and only in the last month more money uh, into uh, medicines and technology, catapults and uh, genomics. So uh, strong government support continuing. I think that that's, uh, this has been developed over a period of time, and if you look at the R&D fiscal environment for the UK, uh, the combination of low tax rates and patent box can deliver an effective tax rate of 11 to 13 percent with tax losses being able to be carried forward indefinitely and offset against future profits. When you put all of these elements together, I think that uh, we have in the UK an R&D fiscal environment already that um, Donald Trump would be uh, extremely proud to be able to deliver in America, uh, and I think he will be unable to deliver in America. So we're already there, and that's one of the reasons why we're a great place to build and scale uh, a life science business. 
Equally, when you look at the vibrant community that we've got in terms of a, a global cluster, we have, uh, you know, uh, we have money, we have IP commercialization, we have financial services, we've got government match, match funding, and the ability to uh, tax efficiently put money into the sector. So um, uh, all things heading in the right direction here. And then if you look at what that translates into uh, down the months and the years, you'll see that there's lots going on in the UK sector, continued investment, whether that be uh, private investment in terms of research centres, whether that's uh, government investment, whether that's uh, raises by smaller companies, um, or lots is going on month in, month out, whether that's the expansion of, of capacity in, the, um, uh, in uh, manufacturing, uh, whether it is uh, new spin-outs from uh, the Crick, um, lots and lots going on uh, across the, the piece in the UK sector, and I could have pulled many more. So, uh, as you can see, activity continuing uh, throughout the year. Um, I'm particularly looking forward to going to Oxford Biomedica uh, next month for our BIA meetup in Oxford and to learn more about the uh, supply deal they've done with Novartis uh, in terms of the lentiviral vector uh, production that's at the heart of Novartis' uh, next generation product. So lots going on uh, and uh, lots to be uh, uh, to be very proud of uh, and I think vibrant uh, during this year. Uh, coming up, we're expecting the Life Science Industrial Strategy, uh, um, the report commissioned by the government and written by uh, Professor Sir John Bell, uh, I expect to be published this month. We haven't got much of this month left, but I'm expecting to see it in the not too distant future. Uh, which I hope will bring together industry and the broader life science ecosystem, uh, explain uh, some of the opportunities, some of the strengths of the sector, and uh, focus us on uh, the period ahead and what we all need to do. Um, I think the thinking in government is that that will lead to a sector deal uh, later this year, and alongside that separate process led by the Treasury, there's a, uh, a discussion around how do we get more patient or long-term capital uh, into uh, into um, into the UK economy, into innovative sections of the UK economy, and I think there's an opportunities for us there. There's also going to be a broader industrial strategy white paper from the government this year, this year <clears throat> and here's our response into it. So not only is there lots going on, lots done, there's also uh, a full pipeline of, uh, of supportive and helpful uh, things that are likely to happen going forward. And if you are planning uh, 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 putting Brexit in context for global CEOs in your own organization. Um, I think this year it will be interesting to see where this sits compared to some of the other issues that are faced by the by the sector or by people who are operating in uh, multinational environments. Um, it was interesting to see the, um, the reaction uh, of the President of the United States to Ken Fraser's um, uh, resignation from the Manufacturing Council. Uh, I think if you've seen uh, the, um, the, 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 the the discussion in Poland about uh, Poland's behaviour uh, with regard to the EU, I think that's one that's coming up on people's uh, people's radar. Uh, Turkey obviously is in a, uh, a period of transition uh, and uh, we've had uh, scandals around Europe's eggs and, 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 and Danish fish uh, just to make sure that uh, our summer hasn't been uh, been quiet. So yes, I think you should uh, have this on your uh, on your radar, but I think there's plenty of other things that people are worried about. So what's happening next? And perhaps the best way to explain that from our perspective is what are we doing at the BIA? I suppose on the left-hand side we are focusing on Brexit and on the right-hand side we're focusing on the flip side of Brexit, what's going on in the UK. So we will continue to work on trade and regulation through the UK-EU steering group set up last year uh, and a formal engagement with government uh, where uh, not only uh, information is exchanged but, uh, um, but we can continue to advocate and provide expertise. Um, we've talked a little about, uh, Laura's talked about the Migration Advisory Committee and the opportunity to input sector views on the movement of people. Uh, that's another important priority heading towards October. And then on the flip side of this, um, John Bell's report on the life science industrial strategy and then the sector deal about the future of our sector in the UK, I think will come to fruition uh, across the autumn. And we will see uh, in the patient capital review by the, uh, by the Treasury, a discussion around how we uh, enable an important leg of the stool of our sector, um, more money into the sector uh, and processes for that uh, in that policy discussion. Now, I need your help. Um, the negotiation process on Brexit, and now I'm talking solely about Brexit, um, 
we're finding that there are repeated asks from the UK government for us to provide industry insight and expertise around some of these uh, knotty or thorny issues which um, spring up or questions that arise from, from, uh, from the discussions that they're starting to have. And there's no clear roadmap for this because nobody has in the, part, in, in the past um, sought to negotiate an exit from a, uh, a large multinational uh, organization which has trade and uh, regulation bound up in it. And what we're trying to be is a, a useful and expert partner to, to the UK government to enable them to secure the best deal for our sector. And I think that we are obviously conscious that many of our companies operate in a global environment or certainly uh, across the EU. So we're looking to um, make sure that we are engaged with you uh, in our membership to assist us. Um, and what we are hoping to do is be able to share with you uh, the questions the government is seeking some answers to, um, something of the, the importance of them to us in our sector and the timelines against which we are um, uh, needing to operate. Um, we don't think everybody will be able to, to help with everything, but if you're prepared to be on a an email group where we ask um, potentially random questions about um, uh, about uh, aspects of Brexit. Um, do please drop Laura uh, uh, an email because what we need is a rapid reaction force of industry expertise. We've been lucky to be able to call on you repeatedly over the last year or so. Um, but I think this is how um, I, I, I'm imagining it's going to work in the next uh, period of time. It's going to be a rapid process, and, and this is really important. Um, the the uh, negotiators in Brussels are meeting every two weeks, and papers are being produced and being discussed. And really what's happening from where our perspective is, we're getting a request for evidence from the UK government. Can you help us with this? Usually perhaps that's on a Monday. We circulate it to members and partners. We seek that information to come back. We share that with the Office of Life Science, the Office of Life Science, synthesize that with other views that come from other people. There's then an internal government review across the various departments, because this is something that has to be worked through Whitehall and Westminster. There's then a discussion about whether that is included in the information that DEX-EU use as part of the negotiation, um, with the outcome that we hope that any negotiation is based on, um, on real, um, real experience and the substantive um, experience of uh, practitioners in what is, uh, what, which is bread and butter to us as in our sector, but it's quite difficult for people who have no concept of, uh, of how our sector works. And we think that we're going to be in a sort of call and response mode where we need to be able to provide this in a timely fashion for negotiators in a format that they can use, and that's likely to be on a two-weekly basis. You can see that there's negotiations on the 28th of August, the 18th of September, and the 9th of October. I suppose this is just really a, a plea to say we're keen to continue to involve you. If you're prepared to accept a ridiculous, um, go on an email where we may ask you at ridiculous timeframes for your views or expertise, what we don't want to do is, um, uh, is miss the opportunity to provide expertise, even if it's at the most brief level as things move rapidly during this phase. And we're trying our best to provide a process uh, that we can uh, enable expert advice to get into what is now quite a, uh, a uh, speedy time frame for a negotiation. Um, I don't think we'll do this perfectly, but I hope you can understand um, why I've included this. And again, I, I, I thank you for your engagement, and um, it's what's enabled us to to um, to present, uh, I think, meaningful um, impact to, uh, to to the UK government negotiating position so far. And let's hope we can continue with it. Another thing we're going to do um, as a response to, to member um, request is we're going to do um, some seminars for BIA members across the autumn, which are, aren't really about um, how we prepare a position for UK government or prepare a position to inform the EU. This is more about what do I need to do in my company to make sure that I am ready for the scenario that is rapidly likely to come upon me with regards to trade, regulation, movement of people, research, collaboration, and finance. We're in the planning stages of these at the moment. We think these are the topics where peer-to-peer -peer discussion, this is how I'm looking to do it, what are you thinking of doing? Um, this is where we've got to that type of discussion um, to enable particularly smaller companies, uh, but, but actually some of these issues cut across uh, bigger companies as well. What are you doing to prepare? What decisions have you made? What timeframes are you working on? How can we um, help people with the best information against timeframes we know that they've got to do? This is our um, 
and new endeavor for, for the autumn and probably into the new year. So if you're interested in this, you think you've got a story to tell, or you'd like to, to come to one of these events, please register your, in, your, your interest at a slightly different email address here, biaevents at bioindustry.org. And if you can just say Brexit planning series, I'm in, or Brexit planning series, I think you should do this, that would be really helpful from our perspective. Um, and we're, we're working towards those um, this year. Uh, the key thing that we have got this summer, uh, this autumn, which is organised and ready to go, is the Bioscience Forum on the 12th of October. I hope you have it in your diaries. Um, we have panels and discussions there talking about Brexit and industrial strategy, funding sources potentially post-Brexit, IP and innovations, uh, and early-stage clinical trials. We're delighted to, that uh, Sir John Bell, the author of the Life Science Strategy, is going to give an opening keynote. Uh, the programme and speakers is on the forum website. And if you have one date for a diary uh, for face to face with with uh, colleagues and, and everybody else, um, this is the one for us. Uh, it is in London, and I hope you'll be able to make it. I'm conscious of time, so I hope that in that half an hour, we've given you some details from the UK government um, on the issues that BIA uh, members have identified as important over the last year. We've talked about the first government consultation around the movement of people and how we're going to involve in that. Explained how negotiations are ongoing and how they're getting more detailed and gathering pace and how we can engage with that. Giving you some thoughts on why the UK remains a fantastic location for, for biotech. Sought your assistance and explained why it's going to be at a ridiculous pace and um, uh, made you aware of uh, our thinking around doing some Brexit planning events and the Bioscience Forum. I'm now going to transfer over to some questions and I have had some questions uh, already come in uh, um, which I was going to answer in the first case and then I shall go to some new ones. So um, the first one that, I, that I've got is um, why aren't you talking about dynasty, Steve? Uh, because you described this as the dynasty process. Uh, the, uh, and um, one of the reasons is, I don't know if you saw this, that dynasty, the great 80s TV series, a, a classic feud between the um, Colbys and the, the Carringtons, has been re-picked up, probably as a result of this Brexit webinar series. Uh, I can't say that Joan Collins is going to return. Uh, but it's going to be all around Fallon and her, her soon-to-be stepmother. But rather disastrously for me and for this Brexit analogy, they are thinking of planning that the, uh, the, the stepmother, rather than being British, is going to be Hispanic. So I don't know uh, how we're going to, going to deal with that. So um, I'm having a rethink on how whether we should continue to use dynasty as the analogy. Um, thoughts on a postcard, please. We also uh, used to talk a lot about the European elections and whether that would have an impact on the Brexit process. So... Just to check in, um, German elections are still planned for uh, this autumn, um, and we are uh, uh, 25th of September, uh, Laura reminds me. Uh, the, uh, and Angela Merkel's CDU uh, seems to have taken a, uh, a lead ahead of the SPD uh, at this time in snapshot in the polls. So, you know, we were talking about who will do the deal um, uh, at the moment, and, you know, this is politics, so who knows? Uh, it seems that Angela Merkel is... Uh, um, is uh, is ahead in the polls. Let's go no further than that. And you'll remember the, the Dutch elections when we talked about these beginning of the year. Um, the election was on the 15th of March, but as yet, no deal. No final agreement. Far parties trying to work together, but no government at all um, in, uh, in the Netherlands since the 15th of March. Um, uh, it was interesting to see follow up where do things get to. In the UK, uh, there's talk of a new political party in the papers. I think this is a bit of a summer papers talk. James, James Chapman, a former advisor to David Davis, is uh, looking to launch a new group with a pro-EU People's March and party launch um, uh, beginning of next month. Let's reverse Brexit with no second referendum is the cry. Um, this is his Twitter profile. Um, I think it will be interesting to see uh, whether a Macron moment will happen in the UK. I won't be... Um, uh, betting BIA dollars on this. Uh, I think it uh, will be interesting to see where this is by um, uh, September the 11th, but I, I, I note it because people have asked me about it, uh, and um, we live in strange times with regards to how politics moves. Perhaps the more, most useful um, one that uh, you, uh, that may be useful for you is some information sources, particularly around Twitter, that might be worth um, uh, grouping or follow, following. Um, uh, we're going to tweet this slide, so if you're following us on Twitter, um, this is the way we'll do, but we've grouped it into some conservative ones, some, some EU ones, some Labour opposition ones. Uh, uh, another plug for Politico here, I don't know 
quite how we're managing to give Politico such a big plug here, but they they do they seem quite a useful um, update on this uh, uh, recently, so uh, maybe worth uh, following uh, them as well. So here's some Twitter sources that may be of use to you. Let me, uh, as I look at the next events, go to some questions that have come in and uh, see if I can answer some of those. So. Could I provide an example question that you think the rapid reaction force of members might be asked by government? Are they likely to be requests for facts and data or just opinion? Great question. Um, we have a basket which is random requests from government and I suppose an example that we've had recently is do you know a UK SME who is exporting not just to the EU but some other global markets and how the tariff and trade barriers affect them with regard to uh, emerging markets versus the EU market, and can we know the answer by tomorrow, please? Um, that was an example. So uh, I think that they they probably fall into the category of um, exemplars. Um, often the policy or the 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 um, the the idea that the government or the parts of the government are trying to advocate for is understood as a policy level, but what they're trying to do is bring that to life with real world examples. So I think they're often in the category of real world examples. Um, uh, sometimes they are, what do you think of this? But it's most often, um, can you help us with an example or, um, uh, or a case study? So that's what I'm expecting, but um, uh, I don't quite know. And you've also, someone's also asked if we can reiterate the email address for, for Laura. So Laura, what's your email address? Um, lconister at bioindustry.org. So L-C-O-L-L-I-S-T-E-R at bioindustry.org. Okay, um, any other further questions at this stage? So I will remind you of the upcoming BIA events. Um, obviously, I've talked about the Bioscience Forum on October the 12th. Um, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing many of you at the networking lunch in Oxford on September the 14th or so. Um, if you're interested in manufacturing and bioprocessing, Bioprocess Conference in Cardiff at the end of November is also an excellent event. We will be continuing to do Brexit briefing webinars, 29th of September, the 20th of October being the next two dates. And we are taking bookings for the BIA gala dinner in the, in the brewery uh, the 25th of January. Tables are going fast there. If you're not a member, do please uh, consider uh, joining the BIA. Jane Wall uh, is uh, always interested to hear from you. Uh, and unless there's anything else, I'd like to thank you for joining us and invite you to join us once again for the next Brexit Briefing webinar on Friday the 29th of September. Well, I think we'll see where some of those negotiations have got to. Many thanks. <laughs>